for the Book of Romans several weeks ago. And uh, next week we'll get to the verse where it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So uh, that kind of puts us in the mood for it. Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. While you're turning there, I'd just like to thank uh, Pete and Mike Manning for putting the TV screen over my head. I hope they put it up well. <laughs> That's why I came over Friday night, just to make sure it didn't fall on me. Because, you know, it's not going to hit the pulpit, it's going to hit me. So anyway, but it's a really blessing. They jumped right on that and put that together to make it a little easier for the choir to be able to see the words. And so that's just really good to see that we have servants in our church who just put, don't put things off. They just jump at the opportunity to serve the Lord. Now, Romans chapter 1, we've been really just in the introduction the last few weeks, and we're going to continue in the introduction because today we want to look at verse 8 all the way down to verse 15. And as we do so, let me just start by just talking to you about how different people in my life have come into my life, godly people in my life, and really have, have taught me a lot about what it means to be a Christian. You know, these men who've come into my life, and some women, have taught me how to, to serve the Lord and have made a, a gigantic impression upon my life to what it means to be a servant of the Lord. What does it really mean to serve the Lord? And uh, I could name names and... Um, but it doesn't serve our purpose, just to know that God always brings people into our life to help transform us more and more into the very image of Christ. And one of those people that I've never met personally, but I look forward to meeting sometime in the future, is the Apostle Paul. Because the Apostle Paul, I think, was a great man of God. And I'm reminded again that, to me, he's a living example of what it means to be a servant of God. Amen? And we look at Paul to be in the Scriptures, to be somebody special, you know, because he's in the Bible. But you know, Paul was a person just like you and me, flesh and blood. He had good days and he had bad days. He had sin in his life like we have sin in our life. But there was a difference in Paul. Paul was a servant of the Lord. He was sold out absolutely to God. And as he, he writes this letter to the Romans, whom he had never met before, as he writes this letter, he introduces himself as the messenger of an apostle of Jesus Christ an ambassador of Christ. And, and he talks to them about what he's the ambassador of, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God has entrusted that gospel to everybody in this room. We are all ambassadors for Christ. And God has called us to take that word into the uttermost parts of the earth so everybody can hear the good news that Jesus Christ saves. Amen? And he, that, that's been entrusted to you, and that's been entrusted to me. And so Paul is writing to these people to tell him, or tell them, a little bit about himself. And in our text here this morning, verses 8 through verse 15, Paul is talking to the, the Romans about certain things that he wants to do when he comes to them, but I want us to look between the lines just a little bit and see some characteristics. There's nine characteristics here that I see that are genuine Christian traits that should manifest themselves in everybody's life. Everybody who is born again, everybody who's a child of God, should have these traits in their life. So, you know, take out a piece of paper and just jot these down as we go through them and take an inventory, a spiritual inventory to see where you actually, if you're actually manifesting these characteristics because these characteristics are those characteristics that make an impact upon people, like many of those people who have come into my life and made an impact with me. So let's begin looking at verse 8, shall we together? Isn't this exciting? Okay, it says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Number one, every Christian should be thankful. Every Christian should be thankful. You know, as Paul begins here writing to the, the Romans about his motives of wanting to come and see them, he tells them that he is thankful for them. That tells us a lot about the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul had nothing to do with the founding of the church at Rome. But he wants to come there and he wants to be a blessing to these people. I think many men would have been jealous because the Romans look at the church, it says that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. I mean, I wish I had begun that church. I mean, I wish I had a good part in that church. Paul doesn't say that. Paul simply says that he is thankful, thankful through God for you all. One of the things, and I'm sure it's true in your life as well as is mine, is some days I get up and I'm not very thankful. Things I gripe about, things I can complain about. And sometimes I just lose the joy in my life because I find myself being unthankful. 
I find myself being a complainer. We as God's people need to be thankful because so much has been given to us. You know, we've been delivered from hell. We've been given an opportunity to walk with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We know what eternal life is. It isn't living forever. It's having an opportunity to know the creator of all things. And he has given you and me that opportunity to walk with him and to know him. And we should be thankful all the time. It says in the Bible, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, in everything, give thanks. Well, that's hard to do, isn't it? When bad things come into our life, we don't want to give thanks. We want to gripe and complain and get angry and get mad. But the Bible says when we are letting ourselves be filled with the Holy Spirit of God, this characteristic is going to manifest itself in our life. We're going to be thankful people. So can I suggest to you that maybe what we need to work on a little bit is being thankful? Being thankful for the opportunity to be alive today, the opportunity to be in church service today, the opportunity to serve the Lord today, the opportunity simply to be a child of God and to realize that Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago went to that cross and paid my sin debt and gave me the opportunity to have eternal life. And by my faith in what he has done for me, I have obtained eternal life, an opportunity to know the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But as I was mentioning, a lot of Christians today just aren't very thankful. I'm telling you, and you've heard me say this before, sometimes Christians have the worst look on their faces. Now, I'm not saying that you all do today. Don't get me wrong. Don't read words into, you know, what I'm saying. But we, we just are not very thankful. How do you go about cultivating a thankful spirit? I mean, that's what we want to know, isn't it? How can I be thankful? How can I give thanks for everything? Because some of the things that come into my life aren't very good. How do I cultivate a thankful spirit? And here's the answer. Are you ready? You ready, Joe? Here it is. You have to learn to make Jesus Christ the center of everything that you do. He has to become your sufficiency because when he becomes your sufficiency, you're going to be satisfied. You don't need stuff. You don't need things. You don't even need good things to happen. All you need is Jesus because he's sufficient for you. And very few Christians formulate their life around the person of Jesus Christ. He has to become the center of your life. The center of your life in church, we understand that. But how about the center of our life at work? The center of our life at home, on our family life, in our marriages? He has to become the hub of our life. And because if our relationship to him is right horizontally, then our vertical relationships with each other and our families, our spouses are going to be right as well. And we can be thankful, be thankful people. The secret lies in simply being satisfied with Jesus. And I think there's another application I want to make here in verse 8, because he says that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. And I believe it should be true of not just the Church of Rome, but Daniel's Missionary Baptist Church, I think our church should have the same testimony that this Roman church had. That all over West Virginia, all over the world, people should talk about Daniel's missionary Baptist church. It says that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Wouldn't that be great? People in India, people in China knew about Daniel's missionary Baptist church. Who are they? People who are satisfied with God. People that have put Christ in the hub of their life. And let me tell you, that's difficult to do in this world that we live in today because the world pulls us away from Jesus. That's why the Bible tells us in 1 John 2, love not the world, neither the things in the world, because they, are, they don't make you happy. They don't make you thankful. Jesus Christ does. And that's why we can give thanks in anything and in everything because he's the hub of our life. And so, number one, every Christian should be, what is it? Thankful. Number two, Every Christian should be committed. Look at verse 9. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. He said, God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit. All that I am, I serve God in the gospel of his son. What Paul is telling these Romans is that he is absolutely, totally committed to the gospel, to ministering to these people. Everything he wrote, everywhere he went, he was a living witness of a man who was absolutely committed to the person and the work of Jesus Christ. 
You notice that word serve there, for God is my witness, whom I serve. That word serve, it's the same word that's translated worship in other parts of the New Testament. For instance, in Romans chapter 12, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That word service carries the idea of service in the temple, worship, worship. I think it's, it's true, and I think it's maybe in my opinion, but as I study the scriptures, I think it's very true. There is no greater form of worship that can be rendered to the Lord than pure, heartfelt service and devotion to God. Do you agree with that? All of us, we worship God every day that we serve Him. Sometimes we serve each other. An act of worship. And so God's people should find themselves, what? Serving. Be servants. Because that's what God has called us to be. Servants. And as we serve Him, serve each other, serve the gospel in the person of Christ, we worship Him. Every day. Pray always. Pray without ceasing. Be thankful always. We can do those things because we're constantly serving the Lord. How about you today? Are you thankful? That's the characteristic Paul is wanting these people to see in him. Are you a person that is committed to the service of the Lord? Or do you say, well, let somebody else do it. See, you missed the blessing. God wants you to serve. And so every Christian should be thankful. Every Christian should be committed. Let me give you the third one. Every Christian should be prayerful. Look at the second part of verse 9. That without ceasing I make mention of you always in my, what? In my prayers. You know, Paul says in the first part of verse 9, for God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. I think that was his priority of his life. The gospel, spreading the gospel, the good news of salvation to the world. But I think he had a secondary ministry. And it was just as vital as the first ministry. And that's the ministry of prayer. I'm here to tell you very disappointing news. You've heard me say it before. Christians really don't pray near as much as we ought. If we really believe that Jesus Christ is God and He has saved me, and someday we're going to stand before Him, and we're supposed to, to create a relationship with Him, an intimacy with Him that leads us to having a deep understanding of His person, a love relationship with God, we should pray always. And that's what the Bible tells us to do. Pray without ceasing because of who Jesus is. We need to become a people of prayer. It was a priority with Paul. He was a person of prayer. In Ephesians Paul doesn't tell us what he preached, or what he prayed, I should say, to the believers in Rome, but in other letters that he wrote. In uh, Ephesians, he tells us what he was writing, to, uh, praying about in the church of Ephesus. In chapter 3, verse uh, 14, it says, For he himself, for he himself, let me get to the right one, here we go. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inward man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height, to know the love of Christ which passes all understanding, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's how Paul prayed. He didn't pray for himself. One of the things that we find ourselves doing constantly is praying for us four and no more. Does that sound familiar? He wasn't praying a selfish prayer, but he was always spiritual, always praying on the behalf of other people. See why? Because Paul was a servant. Paul served the Lord. And I think it's a good lesson for the church today. How much of our praying is done selfishly? I mean, it's all about me. I want to feel good. I want to get healthy. I want my family to be this way, that way. Lord, help me. Lord, bless me. Lord, bless my family. Lord, meet my needs. And there's nothing wrong with praying those prayers unless those prayers become the standard of how you pray all the time. See, when Paul prayed, he prayed for others. And the Bible tells us we're to love the Lord God, our, our Lord, with all of our heart, mind, and strength. All that we have, we love the Lord with, and it says we love our neighbors ourselves. Love our neighbors ourselves. And so other people always come before me, always come before us. 
And I think most of us are guilty of always praying for our selfish reasons instead of praying for the Lord. You know, if you think about the prayer requests that you hear so often, it's, it's people that are sick. And there's nothing wrong with praying for those that are sick because they need to be prayed for. But how often do we pray for those that have a spiritual need? You know, the world's going to hell, aren't they? You know, a lot of people that you know are going to hell, and we don't even pray for them. They don't usually come into our mind because we're just concerned about the physical aspect of our lives. I'm here to tell you there's a spiritual aspect that trumps the physical aspect of our life. If a person dies from a disease, they're going to miss this world, but when they die, they're going to be eternally somewhere. And that's why we should pray spiritually for people. First and foremost, pray for their souls. The most precious thing you possess is your soul. That's yours. And then we can pray for their physical needs. So we have to change our thinking. Physical is important, but it shouldn't be first in my thinking. The spiritual aspect should be first. God wants His children to be under a prayer burden for others. It says in Galatians 6.2, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So how would you describe your, your prayer life this morning? You know, this coming week, we're going to start having prayer in the chapel for our services. Asking God to bring people to our church service. Asking God to bring us to the people out there who need the Lord. Asking God to use us. Asking God to help us to serve Him. Because that's why God has called us, to serve Him. We want power, and power comes through prayer. You have to understand that. This church and your life will never become all it can be unless you learn to pray. And I'm not just talking superficially. I mean getting on your knees and say, oh, God, we need you. Help us. That's how Paul prayed. And did God use him? Oh, God used him. You bet he did. We can all improve, but you just have to walk with God. And so every Christian should be thankful. Every Christian should be committed. Every Christian should be prayerful. And the fourth one, every Christian should be surrendered. Look at verse 10. Making requests, if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. You know, Paul didn't stop with praying for other people, but he prayed that he might be the instrument of God in answering those prayers. You know, God use me, God send me. And he was willing to surrender his life and surrender his will to God's will. And that's what he says here that I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. It's not my will that I want done. It's your will, God. I, I want your will always to trump my will. It's not about me. It's never been about me. It's always been about you. And I want you to be glorified in my life. I want to serve you. I want to focus on you. I want to be thankful. I want to be committed to you. I want to be prayerful. And I want to be absolutely surrendered to you and to your will. You know, when you become a surrendered child of God, your whole agenda in life is going to change. Because it's not about you anymore. It's about you seeking God's will for that day, that moment in time, that whatever you do, you please Him. Because it's not about what pleases me. It's what brings honor and glory to the one that I serve. I want to be a person that's surrendered to God because I want to bring honor and glory to God. And that's the heart of what Jesus had. We need to have the heart of Christ. Paul had that. Paul understood that. That's why God used Paul like that. Because he was a person that was surrendered to God. D.L. Moody once said, the world has yet to see what God can do with a man fully consecrated to him. He said, by God's help, I will be that man. When was the last time you prayed a prayer like that? You thought it was D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was a shoe cobbler. Wasn't a good speaker. Destroyed the king's English, like I do. But you know what? God used him. Why? Because he was willing to be used. He was willing to surrender himself totally to God's will. Imagine what the Lord could do with a church filled with people who were totally sold out to the will of God. We have not because we ask not. And so Paul tells us and shares with us these characteristics that should manifest themselves in our life. Truthfulness. We need to be thankful. We need to be committed. We need to be prayerful. We need to be surrendered. We need to be 
Any others? The fifth one. Anybody know what it is? Next verse, verse 11. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts so that you may be established. Every Christian should be usable. Should be usable. I believe in the every active member plan. And by that, I mean if you're a member of the church or if you attend here, there ought to be other things that you're doing in the church, not just warming the seat that you're sitting in today. You're serving God. What can I do to serve the Lord? I want to be usable. I don't want to be sitting on my, my backside when Jesus Christ comes. I want to be busy serving him because it's an act of worship. You know, Paul is revealing his heart to these Romans that had never met him before. And he says, you know, he wants to come to Rome, and he wants to, he wants to give them some spiritual blessing that he may be established or they may be strengthened. Now, Paul is not going to give them a spiritual gift. Of course, spiritual gifts come from the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God gives as he desires to give. But what Paul is talking about here is that he wants to come to this church and use the gifts that God has given to him to edify them, to encourage them. And just the opposite, he wants their gifts to encourage him. Nobody is an island unto themselves. Nobody. We all need each other. That's why the church is an organism made up of many members but one body. There's no such thing as a lone ranger Christian. God has called us to serve together. And so Paul is saying here that he wa he's wanting to come to them and to be used of the Lord. However God wants to use him that they might be established, they might be strengthened. And I think there's a great need today in our churches, in our church community, for people to fulfill not their own agenda, but the agenda of each other. How I can serve you better. And by serving you, I serve the Lord. Can you honestly say that your life is a vessel that God can use? Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2. He says, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, which is a list of sins, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master prepared for every good work. I want to be prepared for every good work, don't you? And not just because I'm the pastor of the church, but because I'm a child of God. You know, when we stand before God someday, it's not going to matter what you are or what you do. It's how you've served him. How you've used the gifts that God has given to you for his glory. Because it's always, always, always about him. And so every Christian needs to be usable. Look at verse 12 for the next one. Number six, every Christian should be humble. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. You know, I, you've known pastors, haven't you? Walk around like, hey, I'm the pastor and you're not. You know, they have a spirit of holy. You, know, you, you have that class, don't you, at ABC? You have that class where you learn how to be holy. You know, you guys don't have that class there? The word, you do have that class. How, how do people pick that, up, that aspect up, you know? But I have seen pastors, and, and I hope I never become that, because I'm just like you folks. The difference between you and me is that I have certain gifts that God has called. God has used me for these things, and you have gifts too. And so we use our gifts for his glory. You just happen to see mine on Sunday mornings. But I'm no different than you guys. I'm no different. I'm no holier than anybody else. And Paul is trying to say that. He's no different than anybody else. He's just using the gifts God has given to him to edify those people, to strengthen those people, and to glorify God. Because to Paul, that's really what it's all about. But I have known so many pastors, and I'm not preaching against pastors, don't get me wrong, because I are one. But they, they carry themselves, they carry themselves, Hi, I'm holier than you. You may kiss the ring. I need to get one of those, you know. <laughs> but, and I know, I'm not sure why. But I've, I've known people like that, and, and I never want to be that way. I just want to be who I am and serve the Lord. Holiness is all of us. The ground's level at the foot of the cross, amen? And so Paul is wanting to be ministered to by these people. He's wanting to be encouraged by these people, by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Oh, the Bible says, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. You know, I want you to understand that as, as God's people, we need to be humble. And we simply need to thank God for using us. Because I don't know about you, but I looked in my mirror this morning. I saw this guy looking back at him. It's a little scary. Because I know who he is. I know how he thinks. 
I can get into that guy. You know, I know his very workings of his mind. And sometimes I wonder, why in the world would God use that fellow in that mirror? But God does. And God uses the person who looks back at you when you look in the mirror. We're all the same. Servants of the Most High God. Called to serve him until he calls us home. And so we're to be thankful, we're to be committed, we're to be prayerful, surrendered, usable, humble. Look at verse 13 for number 7. We're to be fruitful. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, as was, but was hindered until now, that I might have some spiritual or have some fruit among you, also just as among the other Gentiles. Paul reminds them that he's interested in, in glorifying the Lord. He wants to be fruitful. When the scripture speaks of spiritual fruit, I think there are usually one or, or three things in, has in, in mind. First, I think there's the idea of attitudes that should be present in every Christian's life, every Christian's mind. You know, the attitudes. What attitudes? Well, when you're filled with the Spirit of God, there are certain characteristics that manifest themselves in your life. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, you know, the fruit of the Spirit. Those are things that should be those attitudes should be there constantly. It's the fruit of the Spirit. But also, I think the second idea is the idea of activity. When a believer lives for the Lord, there's going to be activity in that life, and because there's activity in that life, there's going to be fruit that's going to be created for the glory of the Lord. What kind of fruit? Well, holy living, right? That's fruit. I'm living for the Lord. Praise. You know, if you're thankful, aren't you going to praise God? You know, Wayne, you deserve hell. You know that? You deserve to burn forever. Amen. That's what Paul said. I'm the worst of sinners. But, you know, God saved us. God loves us. And we're not going there. And so what should we do? Praise him. Give him honor. Give him glory. Praise him. Be thankful. Let the spirit, uh, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, fruitfulness or, or faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all those things. Let them fill us. But then the third way that fruit is manifest in our life is the idea of addition. And I think that's what he's talking about here. Paul wanted to take the gospel to these people and see people get saved. But people don't think this way anymore. I mean, you're thinking, how can I lead this person to Christ? What can I do today to, to lead someone to Christ that I could bring them into church and get them discipled and let them become what God wants them to be? Paul's wanting to go to this church. He's never even met these people before. So he can have some spiritual fruit among these people. So he can take the gospel and see people get saved. You know, the only way that you can be fruitful is to read John 15. Because he tells us that to be fruitful, you have to be part of the vine. He says, I am the true vine, Jesus says, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I spoke to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. May I suggest to you one of the reasons that we're not very fruitful as people because we don't abide in Christ? We don't pray. We don't witness. We don't go on visitation. We don't read our Bibles. We don't have a discipleship time together. And then we ask God to use us and to bless us. Why should he? Why should he? So these characteristics need to manifest themselves in our life so that we may be blessed by God and also have the power of God. His desire, Paul's desire here was to be fruitful. How about yours? When would you give that much thought, being fruitful for the Lord? So when you want to bear fruit, you have to realize that you have to abide in the vine. And you do that through Bible study, through prayer, through praying together, through you know, cultivating that vertical relationship with God. You're spending time with Him. You're getting to know Him. The Word of God is becoming more real to you. Your strength is increasing because your faith is increasing. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. As your faith increases, you understand who Jesus Christ is more, and you realize who He is, and you begin to talk to Him more. And you begin to be thankful in every situation because you realize that your God is greater than anything that can come into your life. Your God is God. And number eight, 
every Christian should be obligated. Every Christian should be obligated. Verse 14, the Apostle Paul says, I am a debtor. I owe something. Both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, I think 16, he says, Woe unto me, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Why? Paul had been saved from hell because of the gospel. He had been delivered from eternal death by the gospel. He realized the great gift that was given to him. And he felt an obligation to share that gift with other people. How about you? You say, well, that's the Apostle Paul. I'm here to tell you he is a man just like we are. But he was a man that was given to God. And that's what we need to be. We have an obligation because of what's been given to us. We need to give that to others. You see, you're the mouth of the Lord here in this world because Jesus isn't here physically in this world right now. But you are. He's given and entrusted to you the gospel. You are his ambassador. You are his arms, legs, mouth. And he tells us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And so Paul was a debtor to every lost person in the world because he felt a need to share the message with them. And may I suggest to you that's not just because he was Paul the apostle. It's because he was Paul who loved the Lord. Who loved the Lord. So how do I discharge my debt? Tell people about Jesus. Is that a no-brainer? Why is that so hard? Why do we hesitate to share a tract or talk to people about Jesus? Because we're afraid of what they're going to say to us or how they're going to respond to us. But you know, why did Paul keep going back? I mean, he'd get stoned. He'd get beat. And then he'd go back and do it again. Why? Was he stupid? No, he was obligated. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. He realized what was on the other side of the grave that awaited people. It compelled him because he had love for people. And perhaps that's what we've lost, the love for people. We don't pray for the lost. If you check most prayer lists that we ever have or any church ever has, they have a list of people that are sick, but never, never list the people that need to be prayed for, for salvation. We don't have people in our churches anymore who who go out and soul win or get together and pray and say, God, use us as we go to Bill Smith's house or whoever he might be and, and say, God, we want to win him to Christ. We don't pray like that anymore. I'm here to tell you something. We need to. We need to. And then there's one more. We're obligated. But look at the last verse, verse 15. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. That word ready carries the idea of being eager. And that's the last point. Every Christian should be eager to serve the Lord. Eager. I look forward to preaching. I get nervous when I get in front of people because I say dumb things. My mouth doesn't work right. I say words that I make up as I go. But, you know, you serve God. And I want to be eager. Oh, I get up in the morning. I want, to be, I want to read about the scriptures. I want to read something. I want to talk to God. I'm eager to serve him. And that's what Paul's saying here. So much as is in me. In other words, all that is in me. I'm ready. I'm eager to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. Why? He's compelled. He's obligated. He has to go. Life is short, folks. You only have... So many years, so many months for some of us, maybe days. How are we serving him? And so these nine characteristics, these nine characteristics that Paul is kind of talking about to these Romans, if, if they're wise, the Romans would see these characteristics in his life. These are characteristics, I think, that bring success in our Christian walk. How do you stack up this morning? Thankful, committed to Christ. Prayerful, surrendered, usable, humble, fruitful, obligated, eager. Those are all things that describe you or should be things that describe you. And if they're not, that tells you where to begin. Amen? So where are you at today? 
2,000 years ago, Paul wrote this letter to these people. These characteristics matter in the work of God. We need to be like D.L. Moody. I want to be totally consecrated to God, totally sold out, surrendered, absolutely given over to Him, and say, with God's help, I will be that man. I will be that woman. I will be used of God. I won't let Satan deter me. I won't let him sidetrack me. I'm going to focus my attention on what's important, and that's Jesus Christ, because someday I'm going to stand in his presence. And I want to be ready. I want him to say, well done, my good and faithful servant, because you were a good servant of mine. We served him well. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you, Father, for these.